welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Kat Rosenfield. Kat is a freelance pop culture and political writer. She is the author of numerous books, including the most recent, No One Will Miss Her. She is also a former reporter for MTV News, and her work has appeared in various outlets, including, but not limited to, Wired, Vulture, Entertainment Weekly, and many others. In this conversation, we start out by talking about why she writes about culture, why she's interested in that. We talk about the current state of feminism. We talk about why criticism and or dissent from other women not completely accepted within the women's rights uh, movement. We talk about women in the workplace. We talk about patriarchy and patriarchal systems. We talk about Me Too and where it's at now. We talk about women in film. We spend a good bit in the middle of the conversation talking about whether we can separate art from the artist. And specifically, what do we do with some pretty awful men? We talk about how we can rehabilitate and forgive people for wrong acts that they do, and how can they re-enter society. We talk about cancel culture and free speech and many other topics. Uh, I was super excited to have Kat on the podcast. Uh, I've read many of her articles. I really enjoy her perspective. And she not only is super bright, but she also is very witty. She has a good sense of humor. And she's just a bunch of fun to talk to. Um, we did talk about her novel, No One Will Miss Her, um, kind of along the lines of the idea of, you know, how do we understand different complexities with women um, and some of the many, many challenges that they face, um, et cetera. The book does a really nice job of not being too on the nose with some of its themes. And uh, it's just a very, very, very good story. And she's a great writer. So now I bring you Kat Rosenfield. I am here with Kat Rosenfield. Hi, Kat. It's nice to see you. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. I, um, I've followed your articles for a long time and your, your own podcast and I'm a big fan. And so I've uh, really wanted to talk to you for a while. So uh, your novel that's coming out uh, soon is a really good excuse. But I also want to talk about many other things that you've written about. So, uh, so again, thanks. Appreciate it. You're so welcome. We'll hit it all. <laughs> yes, I, I hope so. Um, just tell people who don't know who you are, uh, who you are, what you do, uh, some of your background, and then we'll jump into it. Sure. I am Kat Rosenfield. I am a freelance culture writer. You may have seen my work in outlets like Reason, Tablet, Wired, Vulture. Um, prior to kind of falling headfirst into the culture wars, I was an entertainment journalist. I wrote for MTV News, TV Guide, Entertainment Weekly. Um, I am a novelist. No one will miss her. The novel that's coming out on October 12th is my fourth book. Um, I previously collaborated with Stan Lee, Marvel founder, on his first and unfortunately last, because he passed away, novel for adults. Uh, it was released as an Audible exclusive in 2018, I want to say. And um, what else? What else is there? I uh, am a yoga instructor where I live here in Connecticut. And uh, I spend more time than I should on Twitter trying not to get into arguments with people. <laughs> Yes, that's that's what we're all trying to uh, fight that pool. Um, I guess a few things. I I didn't realize that you had wrote the book with Stan Lee until like recently, like more like in the past couple of months. Um, that's pretty cool. That, yeah, has, that was, had to have been a really cool experience. It was an incredibly cool experience that I was so lucky to have. I don't expect ever to be that lucky again in my life. <laughs> And historically, you did like MTV news and all that, you know, back when MTV played music videos and all that stuff, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, this that would that was before I was a reporter there. You know, <laughs> when did they stop playing music videos in like the 90s? It's, it's, yeah, it's been a while now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so you just, that was one of the, the interesting things about uh, when I was trying to uh, kind of collect my thoughts and, and for the conversation that, that we were going to have, I was like, ah, I mean, you, you just written about pretty much everything. So it's very hard to kind of actually 
kind of find a, a nice cohesive uh, outline. So I think I, I think I got it. We'll see how it goes. But um, you really have written on everything in terms of uh, uh, culture. I guess my one question uh, to just start it off is uh, why? Why are you so interested in culture and what's going on with us? And, uh, and I love your takes. I love your, your, your pieces. They're all really good. But uh, why, why the interest for you now? Gosh, I mean, culture is like, I don't know, it's, it's this, this medium that we're all swimming in. It's how we exchange knowledge. It's how we tell stories, you know, to each other and about our own lives. I, I mean, I just, I don't know. I, there, there's, I think people say that culture flows downstream from politics, or maybe it's the other way around. I just am fascinated by, you know, the way that human beings relate to each other, the way that we, you know, seek truth and seek meaning, um, you know, that that overlaps so much with the art that we consume and the art that we make. Um, and yeah, you know, I think that the sort of the beating heart of everything that that makes people interesting is right there in, you know, the culture that we consume. Yeah, I, I, I like that. Um, I, I'm also interested in people and culture and how we do things. Uh, you know, my world is clinical psych. And so being a clinician, I'm interested in people in a different way, but uh, nevertheless interested in what we're up to and what we're up to with each other and our behaviors. And so I can, I can definitely hear uh, the fascination and interest for sure. So I wanted to start by asking you about, um, really topically about, this is a very general kind of topic, but about uh, women uh, and feminism and me too, and many, 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 many things. You've written many pieces on this. You just wrote a piece uh, uh, that we'll probably touch at some point. Um, but I guess the first question is, is that, you know, you know, feminism has a long history in the United States and around the world, and there's plenty of different waves of feminism. And in terms of culture, we've had over the past, I guess you could say, you know, five to seven years, uh, an emphasis, an emphasis, excuse me, on women's rights and and what that looks like in our modern age and you know where do you think we're at uh with the current state of feminism just kind of as a general concept <laughs> can i just like make a fart noise um <laughs> <laughs> no i i mean i think that feminism has become fractured in the way that that movements sometimes do when they accomplish their initial goals and they've made a lot of progress and then there becomes this question of what next you know mm. Do we disband? Um, you know, do we pivot to something kind of related? Um, do we do we just kind of bundle up all of the problems that still exist in the world for other groups of people who aren't women and decide that that's now feminism? Uh, and you know, I think that depending on which feminist you ask, the answer to any one of these questions is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's just become a little bit incoherent, and. I was raised by a second wave feminist mm -hmm. um, who really instilled in me what I consider fundamental to the, the feminist project, which is the idea that women are people, you know, for better or for worse, right. complete human beings with complete agency and with all of the responsibilities and all the autonomy that that entails, you know, and, and some of that is scary. Um, and I see that, you know, in our sort of current feminist moment, especially in the wake of Me Too, there is a real resistance amongst some people, especially some younger feminists, to that idea of women as empowered, women as having agency, women as moving through the world with, you know, influence um, and the ability to kind of decide and, and, and be the architects of their own destinies, because it's frightening to imagine having the responsibility that goes with that. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think many, many people nowadays don't, well, I mean, maybe I guess some people do, but most people I think are, you know, if you think about, you know, the first wave of, you know, Wollstonecraft and then second wave, you know, with some of the, the feminists in the 60s, most people are kind of on board with that. I think and there are some that aren't, but there are some people that kind of have this sort of mm, position that 
where women's rights uh, or advocacy has gone in the third and fourth wave and you know in the past you know 20 years has been uh more extreme uh, more polarizing and you know i guess that begs the question right do do you always need to keep fighting for something or is there ever a stopping point i guess some people would say yes there is or no there isn't but i guess the one piece to that that is interesting to me is Many of the women's rights groups will seem to have a difficulty in sharing a plurality of ideas. So, let me put it another way, many of them tend to be now currently in the United States and maybe other places in the world, you know, by progressive lefties, which is fine, but they don't seem to support, you know, other women that don't necessarily agree with them politically or ideologically. And it doesn't seem like there's a kind of acceptance for diversity within uh, w w uh, feminine thought. Do, do you see it that way? Or do you see it as more of just like, you know, it's overblown? Or how do you see kind of the f uh, splintering or fracturing uh, within women's rights? I mean, there's definitely, you know, uh, orthodoxy, at least in parts, that really does not tolerate dissent, really does not even tolerate questions or criticism. Um, I guess that, you know, what it kind of looks like to me, and this is a half-baked theory, but I don't think it's entirely incorrect, is that if feminism is the radical notion that women are people, and now we've come far enough that women are indeed just people with every, you know, every variation, you know, that we contain all of these multitudes, um, if if that was your goal to kind of get to a point where women are no longer representative of this identity category and instead we're considered as individuals and we move through the world in that way um it's it makes absolute sense that you would have a lot of trouble then building a coalition in search of you know i mean what right what right could we agitate for in the us at this point that we don't have you know what's what's being denied to us on the basis of sex i have trouble thinking of anything um and i'm you know i'm open to being persuaded that i'm wrong about this but i think that sense that we have achieved a great deal of what we set out to do is now causing that splintering that you were you know observing that um you know there's a sense of maybe we need to sit back and turn our focus to women overseas um but then you know the question becomes there like do they even want western feminism is this really you know something that they want to sign on for and are we being like imperialist feminists in, in trying to kind of send that abroad so yeah i mean long-winded way of saying that i think you know the more women uh, are granted the rights and the ability to move through the world just as individuals, you know, not as women, but as people first, I think you're going to have a harder and harder time getting them to band together on behalf of some women's agenda. Because what is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so look, I, I have friends all over the spectrum. Uh, and I see this happen where I'll have friends that are female that are or family members that are you know, in my family that are you know, women that are conservative but they will be very upset with women's rights groups because they'll say like i can't express my ideas or if i if i don't agree with what they're saying um you know i'm you know ostracized or whatever and i don't i i just i don't understand why i don't understand why it, 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 if if your goal is exactly what you're saying. We need to see women as, as individuals. We need to make sure that they have uh, equal rights and opportunities and all these things. Great. That's great. Why, why, would, why would different ideas be intimidating? Because it's, it's, it's chipping away at a, an ideology or I don't, I don't understand why you would not want to be inclusive of, of women or, or they'll use the, 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 the get out of free card, um, get out of jail free card, um, you know, internalized, uh, uh, misogyny or, you know, they'll find all of these creative ways because someone disagrees with, with you and it's just, it, the person is, has a disagreement. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, do you see this too? I mean, how do, how do you make sense of this? Well, I mean, I experienced this a lot uh, in terms of being called a pick me uh, by by other women who think that if we disagree on a matter of policy or, you know, a matter of ideology, I couldn't possibly hold these views in a sincere way. I must just be pretending to think what I do so that I can impress men, um, which is, 
I mean, I'm not going to lie. It really pisses me off when people say this to me. It's deeply offensive. It's also, I mean, it's frustrating because, in fact, you know, being a sort of a dissident feminist, you know, in the, in, in, the sense that feminism has, you know, come to push certain ideas within the past 10 years that I disagree with, it has not been a good thing for me socially. Mm. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not impressing anybody in my peer group. All I've really done is, is get myself dogpiled, um, mm. and, you know, criticized sometimes in extremely ugly ways. So the idea that I'm doing this to impress somebody, I mean, I have not met the person who finds it impressive. Um, but I mean, when you talk about what what's threatening about disagreement i mean i think this is the thing you you get women to a place where they no longer have to think of themselves as women first they can just think as individuals i'm a person what do i think think about this and you get something like the issue of abortion um you know there are a lot of women who very genuinely and sincerely believe that abortion is killing a, a you know a living being it's that is taking a life Mm -hmm. and you know you can believe as i do that you know access to abortion is still a critical and and necessary right for women but if you exclude everyone from the conversation who believes that but who also has moral qualms about terminating a pregnancy after a certain point, um, or, or at least wants to ask questions about it, you know, then you'll end up with exactly what you see now, a fractured movement. You know, it's like either you're with us a hundred percent or you're against us. And that's, mm-hmm. you know, that's how movements lose momentum and it's how they split apart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm, I'm focusing more on kind of women with other women at the moment. Uh, I'll turn to men in a minute, but yeah, I mean, taking the abortion issue, I think that there are plenty of people, there are plenty of women that sincerely are impassioned about uh, the fact that it's killing a child or a very, you know, unborn child. Uh, And then there are folks that are very impassioned about um, the fact of, you know, it's your body and you are able to choose what you want to do. I don't understand why those, I mean, I understand that they're very different ways of thinking about things and approaching an issue that is very much a um, women's reproductive health issue. But I mean, I, people are going to disagree. People are going to have uh, disagreements about really important things. I don't know why people can't sit with both of those. It, it, it's not a zero-sum game in that way. I, I think for many people it is, but I, I just don't understand why we're distilling all of this stuff into you know, very cartoon versions of something that's really complicated, something that has a lot of uh, twists and turns to it. I, I don't understand um, why there wouldn't be more support. It's like, yeah, I disagree with you, but you know what, as a, uh, as a woman, you know, I, I can, you know, still try and, and respect your right to have that or whatever. And, and we can have some, you know, actual solidarity. It just, it is very puzzling to me. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, that's not just unique to feminism, the intolerance mm-hmm. for, I mean, we, we've really lost in many, many spheres, our abilities to have different different, difficult conversations with, you know, people who have competing ideas and, you know, who are in disagreement. And I have, you know, observed this shift in tone even since I was in college, which was about 20 years ago now. Um, And I don't know if it's, I don't know what it has to do with, you know, the rise of the internet, the rise of social media, you know, do we become the more global the conversation gets, ironically, more siloed and more tribal? Do we cling harder to, you know, what we feel is right? Because there's so much other information out there competing. I don't really know. Um, yeah, I mean, this is this is one of the things that I like about being a culture writer as opposed to an activist or, you know, or in any kind of political realm is I'm not obligated to come up with solutions. All I <laughs> want to do and all I do is kick over rocks and point at whatever is wriggling and writhing around under there and being like, look at that. That's <laughs> gross. Let's talk about like how it got there and what's it connected to and, you know, and what where's it going to go? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, well, you do that well. Uh, you're, I don't see you as a provocateur necessarily, not, not, not for uh, the sake of it. You are trying to say like, look, something's happening and let, let's, let's, let's examine this and let's look at it. And as you said, you know, you, you get a lot of, a lot of hate for it, on, you know, unfortunately. Um, so, so I, I was talking about the kind of the differences with women, but I, now that moving to women and, and men, uh, many women have claimed how 
beleaguered they are by men. Um, and there's plenty of data to show that that's a fact, right? That there's plenty of men that are in the workplace or in social situations, um, et cetera, that, you know, there's some pretty terrible dudes out there that do some pretty terrible things to women, both verbally, physically, et cetera. Um, and yet we also know that women can be very judgmental and condescending and not supportive of their fellow women, as we were kind of alluding to. And I'm, I'm thinking more of this in the kind of the workplace um, and in many other areas of society. Why do you think, uh, again, maybe it's the same answer or maybe we don't entirely know, but specifically in the workplace or in other areas where there's a social context, why um, women aren't as supportive for women sometimes? So one example is, you know, if you have a a female boss that's in charge of many uh, subordinates. Uh, there are times where it can that that uh, woman can be harder on um, subordinates that are women uh, as compared to men, etc. Um, and why do you think this happens? Why why aren't women you know politics aside? I guess just women to women kind of thing. Why do you think that that uh, that occurs? That's an interesting question. I'm not really. I'm not persuaded that this is unique to women. I think that, you know, what we observe when, you know, a, like a female boss is abusive to her underlings has much more to do with what happens when a person who has a certain personality type, who's maybe a little tyrannical and a little bit authoritarian uh, and a little bit abusive gets a little bit of power. And, you know, this is, it may manifest itself differently when it's, a woman with power than when it's a man with power. And I think that has partly to do with the way that female aggression manifests itself. You know, it mm. tends to be more on a social playing field, whereas guys will physically fight if they're, you know, provoked enough. Mm. Um, it doesn't happen as much as it used to. Like, gr gratefully, we're not watching guys out in the street resolving their issues with duels anymore, uh, as entertaining as that might be. But there's yeah, the threat I mean, of that. The threat of that of like, look, hey man, if you if you say something too too cross with me, you know, I I I might do that or I might, you know, threaten to do that. There's definitely that threat with with men for sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes me think of old movies where, you know, two men are kind of at odds and then one of them stands up and says, would you like to step outside? <laughs> me, because I had already, you know, I was growing up in an era where already, you know, it wasn't a thing to really resolve your conflicts in a physical way anymore. And I was like, what are they going to do outside? You know, <laughs> are they going to talk louder? You know, but of course they were going out there to fight, um, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, do fisticuffs. And I was like, why are they rolling up their sleeves? Why is the guy taking his rings off? And then I finally, you know, eventually made the connection. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, all of this is a long winded way of saying that I, I just, I just don't think that women are immune from the seduction of having power and, and, you know, from the temptation to abuse it. And a lot of the contemporary discussion around this seems to center on the idea that they are, which I just find so bonkers. Like we have a lot of human history to look at, you know, to to demonstrate that, you know, women can be just as abusive and just as manipulative, you know, in some cases, even even more so because they're more skilled at these kind of like social subterfuges than men are. Mm -hmm. um, but and yet you still have people on like a global scale saying, well, women leaders, you know, if if only every woman or sorry, if only every country had a woman president, like we would never have any wars again. Like that's categorically bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm not really sure where the temptation comes from to indulge in this sort of like fairy tale um, you know, notion that we would have you know, peace on earth and, and no conflicts ever again, if women were just put in charge, but, you know, de definitely, definitely is not the case. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I agree with you. I, I also don't understand that. I guess there's a kind of a follow-up to that is there's this, um, we might hit it later, but there's this, I know many, many feminists, uh, or I have friends that are, that are more on, on, the one side of things that will um, very much lean on a patriarchal system as an answer for problems that happen to women. This is a, 
you know, you can fill the you fill this in the blank with anything, really. I mean, it kind of becomes a reductionistic argument. Well, that's because of the patriarchy, or that's because of the patriarchal system. And I'm curious of what you think about that. I don't discount or disbelieve that the patriarchal system for many thousands and hundreds of years was the way it went. I, I think that that's true. I don't think that's necessarily a negative thing. I think it has negative qualities or it has had negative chapters, but I don't think it's always a negative thing. But I think when you look at, uh, you know, at least in the West, Western world, and in terms of modernity, I think you mentioned it earlier, I don't know of a space where women don't have a chance or an ability to, to succeed in pretty much anywhere, uh, anywhere that they want. Um, mm. I could be wrong with that. I, I could, you know, maybe there might be some places where it's still very, very, very challenging. Um, and, you know, maybe some listeners will, will say, well, of course you're going to say that because you're a dude, you know, it's not hard for you, you know, whatever, right? Um, but, I mean, this idea or this, this kind of uh, uh, obsession or, or way of trying to answer things with uh, uh, the patriarchy or patriarchal system as, as the, the problem, it's the problem always at, you know, ground zero. I mean, is that overblown? Is that, is there some truth to it? I mean, what do you think about it? I think that there are ways in which you know, a, a system that privileged the male perspective over women's, or in some cases looked at women as if they were like, the, you know, only ever by comparison to men. And so if they were like broken men, they were just unmen, you know, they're just the other. Mm -hmm. um, that there are obviously going to be echoes down the line of, of the biases that you create when that's your foundation for making a society. And a really good example of that is medicine. Um, you know, even though now we have, I think, more women in medical school than men, um, it's you know, just just it's at least half, it's 50 50 or maybe yeah. like 55 45. Yeah, yeah, that balance is definitely starting to tip. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that you could point to any individual woman and say, like, here is a woman who was held back individually on the basis of her sex. And yet doesn't mean that there aren't still issues that date back to, you know, again, you created a system in which women were seen as like broken men, in which there was very little curiosity about the female body, female anatomy, female biology. Um, when there was curiosity, it was also tinged with a lot of fear, um, a lot of allegations of witchcraft. When, um, when you know, when men in like uh, Salem era, discovered the clitoris they were like well that's not right like nobody should have that clearly this woman's a witch um <laughs> so you have you know that you have this system there's no way that you're not going to a thousand years down the line unless you actively go in and start trying to take apart the stuff that that's still you know the biases that are still built in you're going to still see the echoes of that right. a really good example is that even now a lot of medications um, impact female bodies differently mm. but that isn't really investigated it's still not being looked into the way it should it's not understood the way it should be and it, it's really just kind of inexcusable but it's this incuriosity that again is built in and it's no one person's fault it's just this is how the system works um you know the covid vaccine causes we know now a certain amount of menstrual side effects in women and this was something that they uncovered during the trials but they never made a note of it because nobody bothered to ask Ask. Like all of the women who were taking this vaccine were like, oh, this is messing up my period. But nobody asked them specifically about it. And so they never said anything about it. And then when it became more widespread, people were like, is this messing with my fertility? And these crazy conspiracies start cropping up because of this lack of information that's due literally to sexism in the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's where I would say that's like the steel man argument for the continued impact of patriarchy. That said, if I try to think about a moment in my life where I was held back on the basis of my sex, I can't think of one. I can think of times when I was, you know, I had an advantage on the basis of my sex, which, you know, is something I suppose we're not really supposed to talk about. But, mm -hmm. you know, there are there are definitely times, you know, especially in a moment where people are seeking to kind of privilege women's perspectives in order to redress past wrongs. It's not a bad thing to be a woman. Um, so, yeah, 
that's hmm. uh that's the the long and short of it i guess yeah no i like your example you're still in version of it and i would i would agree absolutely um again it's like the easy out for this is that progress happens with trend lines right it's gonna it's gonna go up it's gonna go down but if the trend lines are moving you know progressively forward that's what you want and if right if you have systems that are hundreds or thousands of years it's not going to be you know in 50 years we're going to have you know 50 50 equality blah 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 blah. like it, but I, I think if you if you look decade by decade by decade by decade it's better and better and better overall um maybe some people don't want to hear that or it diminishes that the work that needs to be done and obviously you know you just gave good examples that of course there's still sexism of course there's still uh, the remnants of a patriarchal system but that doesn't mean that it's you know it's not the 12th century, you know, like there's still like there's progress we've made. Um, so I want, I want to introduce here and this part of the, since we've been talking about this for a little bit, your novel, the novel oh. is called no one will miss her. Um, it is fantastic. Um, most people, if they see me online or see books I read or my friends, they, they know I read just about evolution and science and psychology and philosophy and most people don't see me read novels that much i do read novels i mostly read old novels you know literature and things like that uh every now and then i'll read uh modern ones and uh your story was so good it was really 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 good i i, I really couldn't put it down and i'm not saying that because i, I want to help you sell a book i really couldn't put it down i wanted to know what happened um it's very good i i will not be surprised if uh if hbo or showtime or apple plus calls you to do a a, a mini series on it it's very good it really is gosh i sure i sure hope that happens yeah, that'd be super <laughs> awesome wouldn't it um so i bring up i'm bringing up the novel now uh because you know there is uh the main character is a, a woman i'm assuming that was by choice or there was a design for that of why you <laughs> chose the character the main character as a woman um and there is there seems to be a lot of themes that we've already touched on how women treat other women uh seems to be ideas of um self-image or and or i don't like self-esteem but we'll go with that there's some aspects of self-esteem there's uh how do women interact with men and some not so great men um so i guess what were you trying to say with the novel i guess thematically if you if someone reads it it's a fun story sure but what are the the big themes that you were trying to do, if at all, and that you would want people to kind of walk away with. Right. Well, I mean, you know, similarly to my culture writing, I just like pointing at stuff, you know, and, and exploring, I like asking questions um, and making connections. And, you know, I, I see fiction as just another way to kind of explore questions about what is true, you know, and what is the truth of, of how humans behave and what are we doing to each other? Mm -hmm. All of that, you know, novels are driven by conflict and, and um, you know, I, I just see fiction as an, as another way into all of these topics that I think really just kind of get at the heart of, of who people are and how we behave. So in this case, um, without giving anything away, I was really interested in questions of identity, you know, specifically a public identity. And mm. there are two women in this book who are sort of counterpoints to each other. Mm -hmm. One has an identity that she constructed herself it's her public presentation she's an influencer she's created this shell of a person and you know and that's who everyone sees um and you know who is the real her it's it's sort of a question you know um because she's built this veil that obscures the truth of who she is every time she posts you know it it gets this second self gets bigger mm. um Similarly, you've got another woman who also has a self that's not her, but it's one that she's been assigned by other people. Uh, you know, she lives in a small town where, you know, your reputation kind of precedes you. People will decide for you early on who you are and what role they want you to play. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't really matter what the truth is because other people will just see whatever they expect to see. So I was really interested in you know, in those questions. The other thing that drove this 
story was the idea of a toxic marriage. And anybody who reads or writes thrillers will tell you that toxic marriages are just the richest <laughs> vein to mine if you want to explore, you know, like issues of murder and, you know, issues of marital conflict. You know, there's just there's just so much there. There's a reason why Gone Girl, you know, was a so good and so popular and also spawned a million spinoffs, mm -hmm. including including maybe mine. Um, um, but this notion of, of connecting with somebody who's not right for you, but where, uh, what you create together starts to kind of consume you and it starts to kind of define you. And at the end, you've created something so toxic that it's basically destroyed you and destroyed everyone around you. And, and yet it's all you have. And so you cling to it. Um, that's, you know, there's a, there are two couples really in this story mm -hmm. who are at that point. And I think the question, you know, that is interesting to explore is what happens once you reach that point in a marriage, you know, how mm -hmm. does it end? And one of the ways that it ends is that somebody has to die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's a, you, you said a lot without giving anything away, which is, which is great. Um, <laughs> I've been practicing this because there, <laughs> there are several big twists and if mm -hmm. I spoil one of them, I'll never forgive myself. So. <laughs> yeah. And well, look, that's just more incentive for people to go and buy it. But I like this idea of what you were saying about the, the kind of the different selves. It, 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 remake, it reminds me of what many of the, um, you know, phenomenologists such as, you know, Kierkegaard, and he's the one that sticks out the most. Uh, there's others that have, have talked about it in this way, too, is this kind of inner and outer kind of self that we have, right? And I think that there's a very, uh, kind of very on the nose way of doing that now in society that, you know, there's, there's the self we present, you know, on social media, um, and, and, and or for, you know, folks that, you know, um, are influencers, that's a whole industry. Um, and there's this kind of, I think, you know, blurring is, 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 well, who's the real you? And so in that way, I see the novel as something as a type of authenticity, right? How do we find someone's authentic self? How do we see that? Or how do we let people see that or not? And of course, it's fine to, for people to have their private lives. But I think if there's too much of a deception um, where you're trying to tell someone a story that is completely not true about who you are, um, how what do you do with that? Right. And, and then, yeah, putting that in the context of, you know, with a, a married couple and, uh, is, uh, also deeply fascinating because there's lots of layers to obviously how marriage works, but then also to how people in marriage and in different relationships work. So I, I really see it as a book of, uh, authenticity and how do we, how are we being authentic or how are we not being authentic? So that's a, that was my, one of my big takeaways from it. I like that very much. I'm so glad that that was your takeaway. Yeah, I mean, it came through. I, there's, there's so many other things I want to say, but I don't want to spoil it. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, but everyone really should, should pick it up and read it. It's a, it's a really, uh, really good read. It's a really great story. And, and uh, it's nice hearing you kind of explain uh, a little bit more about the kind of motivations and other things that you're trying to, to say about it. Um, so, so just before we, we leave the topic of women, there are two other uh questions i want to ask about so um you've written plenty of things about me too uh um so i don't know i mean just what did you think about it when it happened uh how it all kind of played out and how it's i wouldn't say fizzled out but it's definitely not on the front page news anymore um where do you where do you just where did you see it where is its place in history for women's equality and rights was it I, I don't know. What are your, uh, what, 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 uh, what are the things that you want to poke at with it still at this point? Gosh, I think that history is not going to look kindly on me too, unfortunately. Um, you were saying, you know, it seems like it's fizzled out. I think it's kind of, you know, evolved and gone subterranean in ways that are not, not wonderful, uh, not terrific, has, has lost the focus that made it so important and such a vital movement at, at the time that it first came into being. Mm -hmm. um, me Too was, when it began, it was about something urgent and something that we should talk about, which was women's professional lives and how the pressure to um, to present in the office 
like with a sexual dimension and the the, yeah. the unavoidability of that the fact mm-hmm. that there was basically nothing you could do if you're a woman there's never not this dimension to your professional life in which you're being judged based on your sexual desirability in which you're being judged based on your physical attractiveness that's really unfair and it's unfair to everybody not just to women who are subject to sexual pressure um, in order to advance in their careers, but also women for whom that's not an option. You know, this keeps us from this. This is one of those things that keeps us from ever, you know, being entirely equal with men. Mm -hmm. And when Me Too started, that was what it was about. And I thought it was so great that people were talking about this. People were finding ways to discuss it that were incredibly vital and urgent and and really got at the heart of what makes this a problem. And then it kind of went off the rails <laughs> and, why, why, but why? why why did it why did it go off the rails like is it, i mean who was running the ship here like why did it not just stay focused i mean what what happened i mean here was a movement that was attracting an enormous amount of sympathetic attention an enormous amount of press it had a glow to it i mean the idea that um attention seekers and fabulists and just opportunists were not going to come running to that like moths to the flame you know in hindsight pretty naive mm-hmm. and you know, whoever was in charge, um, just kind of allowed. And, and when I say whoever was in charge, what I really mean is is that I, I think the media has a pretty important role here uh, in in the way that they allowed that initial message to become diluted, hmm. to become derailed by more sensationalistic, but not ultimately, um, you know. Uh, sorry, but like not not social problems in the in the sense that women's equality at work was a social problem. Mm. You know, you had quite soon after, like you had all these exposés. You know, Harvey Weinstein, Charlie Rose. That was all a big deal. That was an example yeah. of the movement at its best. And then all of a sudden, here comes somebody with like the most repulsive revenge porn narrative about Aziz Ansari. And we're treating that as though it's exactly the same. And that's, I think, and I think that many women who were at this point kind of critical of the movement would agree that that's really where I sort of went off the rails. Yeah. Um, you know, once we started trying to use Me Too as a tool to adjudicate interpersonal harms, and it began to become this kind of common understanding that any time something ever goes wrong between a man and a woman, it must be a Me Too issue. It must have something to do with consent or sexual assault or sexual harassment. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everything just got lost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's... It it does seem that it was it became um, it became very reactionary. So I I mean I agree. I mean I think when when Me Too came out, I think that there was a lot of really good things about that because for so long there was these you know pretty terrible dudes that were in very high positions of power that were just getting away with whatever they wanted, which was it's, it's not professional, it's not respectful, it's I mean, you know in some ways uh, cases criminal. Um, you know so of course right of course that shouldn't happen. Um, yeah. And then it just, that, that runaway train just kind of was like that same kind of, in my view, that same kind of intensity was with like the smallest things then it was just, everything was like, you know, at a thousand. And I remember, um, on this one particular piece, uh, there's other things he said afterwards, but you know, I remember shortly when that happened, you know, Matt Damon comes out and says like, look, you know, this stuff is a continuum. Like this stuff is not the same thing. Like, you know, uh, you know, someone, you know, uh, catcalling somebody or something on the street is not the same thing as rape. Like, and it shouldn't be. We shouldn't have the same, like, just one mode all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, you know, people gave him a lot of shit for that. And, you know, he got a lot of, you know, a lot of heat and okay, like, you know, whatever. But like, you know, that, that's where it became, you know, and look, and I think there were some pretty bad faith actors, right? And there was a lot of dudes that were trying to like rationalize at a certain point. And I don't think that's right either, right? Like we have to just call out and say like, this is not okay, but it shouldn't be, well, you know, whatever, whatever. But at the same time, that seems to have become harder when it was, everything was at the same level. 
and it's not at the same level. Uh, it can still be wrong or inappropriate, but it's not at the same level. And mm -hmm. and I agree. I think the Aziz Ansari thing became that was like one of the key moments where it just was like people were like, yeah, we're not going to listen to this anymore. Like, this is insane. Well, I mean, it, it became a turning point not just for how people who were critical of the movement came to think about it, but also for how people who were invested in, you know, the kind of telling the stories out of the movement, they pivoted. Mm -hmm. And suddenly it wasn't about women at work anymore. It was about interpersonal dramas between yeah. like young men and young women. And finding some way no matter how nebulous and no matter how grasping to cram that into some kind of privilege and power framework because that made it suddenly seem like okay you know now we can now we can tell this incredibly sensational like revenge porn story yeah. um and make it seem like it's an urgent social issue so i mean and i i've seen I probably should, I don't want to name any names, but, you know, there have been a lot of stories like this, you know, where women are just basically, you know, Me Too is a great tool, um, but they're using it because it's such a good and effective tool to adjudicate interpersonal relationships that had nothing to do with their professional lives, where they just want to punish a guy who hurt their feelings. They just want to punish a guy who behaved badly. And like, I think that we can talk about that. Uh, I don't like how often that conversation seems to devolve into, as we were discussing before, this notion of women as like living saints who are incapable of um, avarice, of manipulation, um, who apparently never ever want to have sex. Somehow that got to be part of the equation. Yeah. Um, you know, we should be able to talk about the things that go wrong between men and women. Um, ideally, we should be able to talk about that in a way that is nuanced and that doesn't demonize men or male sexuality, which is something else that's happened, you know, a great deal, especially within the past few years. Um, but none of this is a Me Too story. None of this belongs under the umbrella of Me Too, which was supposed to be about women at work. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it just... Yeah, it, the once once that got lost, I think the movement was also pretty much lost. Yeah, have you? Um, this will tie into kind of the my last question here on this topic. What? But uh, have you seen the the morning show? Yes. Yeah. I, do you you like it? You hate it? Uh, in terms of this topic, because I think especially in the first season, I think the second season just just came on. But the first season really tries to give a balanced nuanced view of this there's some really showing that look this is complicated right and there's the obvious negative but then there's many other uh ancillary kinds of stories that are messy they're complicated it's not a clear-cut thing I, I don't know what do, you, what do you think about it yeah i mean you know it's uh obviously you know it's a dramatization i think that they mm -hmm. they did their best to portray it in a way that captured how much you could come away, two people could come away from the same interlude, mm -hmm. from the same encounter with different ideas about what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that the, the problem is that the show ultimately indulges in this idea that is also quite widely prevalent in the discussion, which is that any time a man and a woman have an encounter, she's at a disadvantage because of the weight of 3,000 years of patriarchy preceding whatever is happening between this individual man and this individual woman. I really don't like that. Um, I don't know how you can have healthy heterosexual pairings if you're going to insist that every time you know, two people come together, the woman's already basically on the precipice of being a victim and he's like mm. two seconds away from raping her. Mm. Um, you know, how, <laughs> not, I mean, not only how do you have healthy relationships within that framework, but like that is something that we're telling young people and it's scaring the shit out of them. There's oh, a yeah. reason why like, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. Gen Z is not dating and not having sex. Yeah. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that, you know, this is how we now talk about it in a way that makes it sound absolutely terrifying and incredibly dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it just takes away from the independence and autonomy from a woman of, as a person. It's like, look, right. like, you know, there's, there's, there's a way to talk about that. And there's a way to talk about it honestly, but not where you're you know, stripping that person and you know making them a victim, right? You obviously don't want to be an idiot, but you also want to, you know, truly empower uh, women to say like, here's your, 
here's what you can say, here's what you can choose not to do, et cetera. And so, uh, yeah, I would agree. Last question, uh, it's a big one, but is uh, w- women in the film industry? Uh, I know some people get very upset about this. You know, there's, there's not enough women uh, uh, directors nominated for the Oscars. And, you know, this is a crisis, you know, or there's not, there's just not enough period or, you know, patriarchy is holding them back. It's a, it's a man's game and et cetera, et cetera. You know, many people like to cite the Bechdel test, which is the idea of um, people literally counting uh, how many minutes of screen time that a woman has or how many lines they have. In a, in and whether a they talk about, talk to each other about something that's not a man. That's not right. Right. There's all yeah. these, there's this whole kind of system in there. So, I mean, just as general, and then I'll, you know, follow up, but what do you kind of think about that? And just kind of women in film, et cetera, is, uh, where, where do your thoughts kind of, uh, land this? Cause I mean, you've been somewhat closely, um, uh, attached to kind of this industry, right? You know, you've, you've, you know, written and been around, uh, this kind of stuff. How do you see it? I mean, you know, the dearth of female directors is a real thing. And I think, you know, that's a good example of a, a system that may not, actively at this point individually discriminate against women but mm-hmm. where the the path that you have to travel traditionally to become a film director and especially to make like you know tentpole big budget studio films is one that was more difficult for women than for men um and you know you can point to a number of different factors you can point to like you know kind of old boys club like locker room culture in hollywood like maybe the clubs where a lot of deals and connections were being made you know at least at first didn't even allow women in them Mm -hmm. um you know similar to like you know is business being done on the golf course well you know who's there not women um but again i don't think that it's necessarily that you know, individual women are being shut out because they are women. I think it's right. just a system in which men have always dominated and you would have to flip certain things on their head or you would have to dig into, you know, find obstacles to women becoming directors and getting these kinds of projects that maybe are kind of hidden. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I do think it's, if you look at like the Oscar nominations for best director going back through the entire history of the awards ceremony, the lack of female representation there is not something that happens naturally. I mean, it's it's pretty egregious. And yeah. moving forward, it would be really nice if we could see more equitable distribution there not because women are being pandered to but because whatever it is that's making it difficult for them to do work at that level is you know is taken care of Mm -hmm. yeah this is what this is what really frustrates me is i i agree with you i think that's a legitimate problem right i think it was you know the first female director to win i don't know if it was nominated maybe it might have been both i don't remember but catherine bigelow was the first to win which was mm-hmm. in 2009, that sounds right. Um, that's a long time. What is that, like 70-some you know, Academy Award uh, ceremonies? Yep. And I guess the problem that I have is that, I agree, I don't think it's actively holding women down. I, I think that probably happened before. They weren't allowed as an old boys club, fine. I don't think that's the case anymore, but it, what tends to happen with this kind of stuff is that there's this overcompensating thing that happens so now it's this like we have to make you know this happens with race too now we have to make every film about this you know every and so you know it's not even like a a a wink you know head nod it's like a very on the nose like we are talking about this here is the clear messaging and it's like okay we get it and you know i just don't think that makes for very good storytelling half the time right if you're just gonna be so obvious with your messaging about whatever political uh or social commentary it's like Okay, fine, but you know, and so, and it becomes these kinds of things where there has to be like the the female version of all these other films, right? You know, mm. that that happens, or these it's a remake of this or whatever. Um, and I guess for for me, and I think for most people, and maybe maybe not for some people, but if the story is good, that's usually what what goes for most people. I think people go because they like a good story. It could be man woman, whatever race, whatever orientation, if the story is good, it's good for the most part. And I would agree we should have more good storytelling uh, by female directors and writers and producers that, you know, that should be happening. 
But I think it, the story should drive it, not necessarily, you know, what's between your legs, right? Because that, that feels like you're pandering, right? It's just like, for example, uh, what's her name? Patty Jenkins. Mm -hmm. uh, she directed Monster. It's a great film. Great story. It's very well directed. I thought it was nice. I liked the first Wonder Woman. I thought it was pretty good for a superhero film. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm more Marvel than DC, just so you know. I'm not saying that because you know you're here. I'm really, I, I just, <laughs> that's really, fine with me. <laughs> really, I, you know, if I have to pick, DC is very disorganized. But um, but Wonder Woman two was. I mean, I thought it was trash. It sucked. I didn't. I didn't like it at all. Right. The story was terrible. Right. And so that's not me hating because you know there's a female lead and there's a female director and whatever, whatever. I liked the first one. I liked her previous film. I just thought it was terrible. I just didn't think it was a good story. Maybe that's a sophomore slump or whatever. But so I just think if, if the story is good, it's good. And people recognize that if you could be whatever director you want, I don't know. Am, am I, am I, am I being too Pollyannish here? Is it really more about that? Or what do you think? No, I mean, I think that what you are pointing to is an issue, not just in filmmaking, but also in publishing. You know, when we talk about representation and the real issue is that these industries are homogenous and there's no reason why they should be. You know, there's no reason why you shouldn't have people of all different, you know, of, of both sexes, of all different racial, ethnic, religious backgrounds, whatever, like anybody who wants to be involved, like there's no reason why there shouldn't be a more even distribution there. But what people, you know, mistake the they try to solve it in an aesthetic way. They try to solve it by mm. making it about the content of the stories. So it's like, we're going to do Ghostbusters, but with all women. And like right, right. You know, that movie was so bad and so unfunny and just such a tragedy, you know, which is really unfortunate because like it had a great cast. And yet, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because I guess, you know, it was more about paying lip service to this political movement than it was about making a really great right. film right. it ended up being just a crappy movie um and you see this a lot you know people are like oh are, the film industry suffers from a lack of diversity we're gonna make more movies about people from minority backgrounds but the director and the photography department and the people doing the catering and everybody doing the editing and blah, 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 like every single name that you see after the cast and maybe the director and producer is all similarly homogenous. It's going to be all a bunch of white guys. Nothing has changed. Right. And, you know, I think this is the, the thing that happens is people see this aesthetic shift and they're like, oh, things are getting better mm -hmm. when that means nothing to working people who want access to to, to do this kind of work. And that's really where the change should be being made. But that takes a lot more work than just writing a different kind of story. It means that you have to go back in and figure out what are the obstacles that are keeping people of color or keeping women or you know, whatever from getting these jobs. And in a lot of cases, you're gonna have to go way back and start you know, sure. building opportunities for them dating back to late grade school. A lot of this is about family connections. It's about wealth, you know, and then you're like, oh, I guess we have to also fix poverty so that we can fix the film industry. Like it's, you know, it's just an endlessly cascading series of problems. It's much easier to just make an all female mm. Ghostbusters than it is to even begin to try to solve this stuff. And I think that that, you know, when you, when you point at this issue, that's mm. really kind of what you're pointing at. Is, is that, again, the answers I'll get is, well, it's just patriarchy. The end. Is that what it is? Is there some version of that or, or is it more nuanced? I mean, what are the kind of, you know, what's the ideology of those problems of why we're not having this on the, on the kind of behind the scenes kind of production side? I mean, you can point, well, just for instance, um, you know, a lot of behind the scenes work, especially involving cameras, stunts, mm -hmm. set building um, is you know, requires you to be skilled in trades. It might require you to have a lot of upper body strength. It might require you to be able to lift things and climb things. So already you're disproportionately gonna have more men than women who are capable of doing this stuff just physically. Mm -hmm. And then you're also gonna have, um, I don't remember what the name of this phenomenon is, but it, it basically, it has like a fancy name, but it's where, women and men just naturally have divergent interests and women are more interested in working with people and men are more interested in working with things. And this is like a complete generalization, but if you zoom out to like 30,000 feet, 
it's true. Um, so then again, you know, you're going to have a disproportionate number of men who are seeking this kinds of this kind of work because it's interesting to them and fewer women because it's just not interesting to them. And then you also have issues like, is this an industry in which it's really impossible to, for instance, take some time off and have a baby, which is where and, you know, you want to talk about like the gender gap in basically industries across the board, women make less. That's where that comes in. You know, if you compare a woman who's not had children um, to, a, to a man, then the gender gap basically disappears. So uh, all this is to say, you can say that's patriarchy, but what does that really tell you? It's just, I mean, it's facile and it seems flippant. You know, it's more complicated than that. And pointing at patriarchy doesn't help you solve any of these problems. Yeah, I, I would, I would absolutely agree with you. I, I to me, it's an all, uh, all of those answers are true, right? It's not <laughs> one thing. You can't distill something to one thing and say, "Aha, there it is," because it doesn't really help you solve it either way. It's not. Because if that's the if that's the, the the answer, then the solution is we'll just get all the men out, and then then see and and like that's a not feasible, that's not equitable, and it's not it doesn't make any sense. And so it's like I think there's probably a lot of reasons why, and um, I, you know, I could be wrong, I don't know, but um, I I would tend to agree with you. Okay, so let's discuss men. Uh, oh, let's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> 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 okay, so you've written a bunch of pieces about dudes, um, and um, uh, this should be fun. <laughs> so, um, okay, I'm going to ask you my favorite question, uh, or one of my favorite uh, dis discussion questions, I guess. It usually makes people pretty upset. So I, I actually, when I, when I was uh, wanting you to come on, this is like the first thing I wanted to ask you. So I, and, and now we're in, I've, I've hopefully got you warmed up. I'm really excited about what this is going to be. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to sell it too much. Okay, so how how do we separate the art from the artist? Um, this is something that so many people have a really hard time with, and I understand that, and I understand it's very a, a very complicated thing. And I don't know if the easy answer is well, just some people do that better than others. Um, so we'll, we'll use an example. Annie Hall is a fantastic film. It's a fantastic film. It's wonderful. Most Woody Allen films are pretty good. Not all of them, but most of them. Um, I think Roman Polanski is an exceptional director. I love his films. Um, I will watch every single season of House of Cards with Kevin Spacey because he's a brilliant actor, right? Mm -hmm. But these are some pretty awful dudes, or at the very least, they've done some terrible things or questionable things to, to, to be very generous. Um, and many people will say, well, look, I mean, this person's a fucking piece of shit. I mean, they were doing this and this and this and this and this to women, to young girls. Uh, some of them haven't even been fully adjudicated. I mean, this is terrible. These, these men are, are, you know, monsters that we're allowing them to have a platform. We're allowing them to do something that they, they enjoy, make millions of dollars, have influence in stories for other people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We should not support somebody that's going around doing all this, you know, fucking horrible things. You know, you shouldn't do that. And you should, and, and then some people go further. If you do, you know, you're a horrible person. And, and the, the thing about that is, that can all maybe be true. That has nothing to do with the movie or the novel or, or things like that. And, and many people have this very difficult time of, you can do this with painters and designers and philosophers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How do you understand or how do you think about how can, can we and should we separate the, the, you know, the art from the artist? And, um, and how do we... How do we navigate that from, from other people that may have uh, different opinions? Um, so my perspective on this is very kind of detached because I have no trouble with separating the art from the artist. Um, you know, any more than I care if the guy who made the hamburger that I'm about to eat is like a bad father. You know, I just... 
I feel that people there's you know the the work that people do and the things that they create um, that you know we consume, and then there's who they are and how they treat the you know people in their private lives and you know it's just not I don't really consider that any of my business um, and. I mean, there's a beautiful freedom in that, uh, you know, in just not having to care if, you know, uh, but, but I mean, the really nice thing about it is then you don't have to start trying to draw individual lines, you know, well, I'm okay watching this movie by a man who was accused of sexual assault, but I won't watch a movie by a man who was accused by several people of sexual assault. Like, you know, once you start trying to like, you know, do these gradations, it really becomes incredibly complicated and you're going to end up with, you know, a set of, I mean, you're not even going to end up with a set of rules. You're not going to give get any kind of framework that you can actually like use for, for living your life and engaging with art. What's interesting to me is that we only have this conversation when it comes to art, and I I wonder if that's because we are always involved in a certain amount of magical thinking about the impact of art on our lives as opposed to other things that we consume. You know, like if I'm bought, like you know, if I'm eating the burger, um, you know, I'm not osmotically absorbing, you know, the character defects of the person who created it. Uh, if I drive on a road and the guy who was just there paving it, you know, was like a bad person, that means nothing to me. The road is still drivable. Um, for some reason, we think about this when it comes to art as though you know the art is going to get inside of us and so too are the bad things about the person who made it like you know somehow we're going to be tainted by it and i think that this is a very romantic but also kind of a silly way of thinking about art you know ultimately this is something that somebody created and I reject the idea that you know just because you want to consume the good thing that somebody made um, that it means you're endorsing every aspect of, of their life, let alone that you're in some kind of danger of like, you know, propagating the badness that they perpetuated in some other part of their life. Okay, so, so uh, for a few questions. Okay, the first question I have is, is why? Why are you able to do that? Why, why what, for you just personally, why, why can you you know, watch a Woody Allen film and, and feel nothing? Nothing for any of his uh, uh, people that he had misadventures with, to say at least. Okay, we're we're gonna we're actually gonna have to have a little discussion about this because okay, Woody Allen is only accused of having done one bad thing. That's He's not what of- Ronan Farrow told me. That's not what he told me. He gave the definitive, the end story on this. Woody <laughs> Allen is accused of having molested his daughter, adopted yes. daughter, Dylan. Um, you know in the midst of this very acrimonious split with Mia Farrow, Dylan's mother. This was investigated at the time by two separate governing bodies. And at the time they determined, you know, not necessarily the truth, but to the best of their ability, um, that he had not done what he was accused of. And it's very, very strange to me that we're not only unearthing these allegations now 30 years later but that people want to treat the investigation into them now as though it's in some way superior to the investigation that took place 30 years ago in the immediate aftermath of of when this was alleged to have happened um whatever else you want to say about this the idea that we're getting like a more reliable take on it now um or a more truthful take that we're going to get closer to the truth now adjudicating it this long after the fact um that's just kind of bonkers to me i don't really understand people who who feel that like this time we're going to get it right whereas that time those people who were the best in the country at what they do, who were tasked with unearthing the truth, who cared deeply about the well-being of children, that they just kind of whizzed it down their leg for some reason. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, Woody Allen, it, all of this is to say, I don't think he's a good example. Um, you know, I think that at the very least, it's completely ambiguous whether he did a bad thing or not. Um, but that said, why am I able to do this? Um, I I suspect it's because I am, 
I don't want to say better because it makes me sound like I'm bragging, but I don't know how else to put it. So I'm better at decoupling than mm -hmm. people who find this stuff very upsetting. Is it, um, is it just a, a dissociation thing? It's a segregation thing in your mind. You can just compartmentalize really well and just be like, that's where that is. And that's where that is. And the twine don't have to meet. Yeah, I think so. I mean, and I, I, I find that this is true across the board when I'm writing about issues, you know, mm -hmm. that it, there, it's, it's often the case that when you try to talk about a difficult topic, people will say, well, you can't explore this or you can't say that because somebody from the other side could use that to do something bad. And, you know, that's never been persuasive to me. It's like the truth is the truth and I'm interested in whatever the truth is. Um, and, you know, if somebody from the right finds that useful in some way, that should not alter our ability to discuss things that are true. Mm -hmm. But this is a perspective that a lot of people don't share. Mm -hmm. I guess my, my counter to this is, so I agree with you um, uh, on all accounts, but, um, and, and that's why people get mad at me, right? And some people mm -hmm. say, well, you know, that's kind of your job. You have to kind of do that and see the neutrality of people. But really it just, I, I'm, I'm also the same, I, I, you know. Mike Vick did some horrible things, but he doesn't have any impact on how he throws a football. And I wish I could have seen him throw a football a lot more, I mean, you know, whatever, whatever. I mean, he did his time. Okay, fair enough. But, you know, but, you know, there's plenty of examples, but the, the argument. So I have a, a friend of mine. Uh, he's a philosopher and professor of philosophy, David Hoinsky, and he, he does a lot of work on looking at the bio, or bi, excuse me, by bi, um, biography of philosophers. And he does this really cool, like most philosophers, they don't give you an answer to things, right? Which is why I love them. They're great. Because they'll just like, let's talk about this. And like, we'll get no answer to this. But, you know, it's mm -hmm. a great exercise. And he'll say, the person's life and, and their passions and what they're going through is in their writing. It's impossible to separate that, right? I'll bring this closer to home for you. There is days or moments or things uh, that were impacting you in your life when you were writing your novel. Right? Maybe you had a, you know, a bad fight with somebody. Maybe you had a really nice accomplishment. Maybe you had, you know, whatever. And that day when you sat down to write it or the day you wrote to edit it or where did that thought come from? Or where did that, you know, subplot come from? And it just comes to your mind. And there's a whole aspect of you, the author, with your life experiences, with your feelings, with your thoughts, with your opinions. It's, it doesn't come from from, from a vacuum somewhere. It's coming from a, a living, breathing person that has thoughts and feelings and intuitions and sensations. And then that's put into a story of whatever, whether it's, you know, or a painting or, or, or a set of ideas. And that's usually the counter I get is, yeah, but you can't, when someone makes a film or when they write a novel, there's a little bit of them in there. It's coming from their head. It's coming from their mind. They're, they're only they would construct it that way. How can you not see a little bit of the, the creator in a piece of art? And are, are you still, I mean, you disagree with that or you still see, you're still able to make the segregation? How, how do you sit with that? Um, I don't know. I would have to really sit with that for a while to come up with, to, to, to totally understand what I think about it. I guess my question is not to sound flippant, but so what? You know, mm -hmm. so, okay, so, so a bad person made a good film. Um, and what, what do we imagine is the argument that you can't watch the film without implicitly endorsing the bad thing that this person did? So I'll give you my answer. This is the answer I give. <laughs> to me, it goes down to the human condition, which is people are extremely complicated and in my view people can do the worst things possible to themselves to each other and they can do the best things to other people and to themselves right we have the potential to do terrible things but we have the potential to do amazing very benevolent altruistic things as well and we can literally do that moment to moment you know i can walk out the door and with one relationship have certain kind of uh, uh, interaction and then someone else I could treat them like dog shit but I'm the same person that is able to do this this complete 
multivariate menu of options and interactions and feelings and all of these things. It's it's like it's like if you take uh you know the quote unquote criminal who you know murdered someone and they're doing twenty years in in jail or whatever and they can create some of the best art. They can create you know great stories, right? And we are really complicated. And so when I think about this in terms of film, so you're you're talking about one angle which I agree with. So I see it in two ways. First, there's the connection between the person that makes the art and then how that is impacted in their art, right? And how do we how do we sit with that? But then what you're saying is the viewer is somehow potentially contaminated by the medium or 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 the creation itself and somehow directly links back to that. And I don't think so. I agree with you. I don't think there's a contamination there, right? You could know nothing about it and still get something from it. You know, you could say implicitly or unconsciously you get some themes, maybe, you know, who knows. But I think that there's a, there, there's these two kind of issues. And for me, I, I, you know, I just think humans have the capacity to do the worst and the best things. And sometimes in the same moment or, or in successive moments, um, you know, probably my favorite book uh, I don't really have favorites, but one of my favorites is Crime and Punishment. Um, you know, I know it's kind of cliche, but, you know, Dostoevsky wrote the, like, complete psychological profile of, of a person. You know, here's someone that's, you know, just not that interesting in society, uh, objectively, and he goes and kills two people. Almost mm-hmm. in, in, a, in a weird, instinctive way. He didn't have any intention to do that. He sort of kind of thought it out. And then... How does he feel after that, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and all of the different kinds of human experiences after the fact. And so, I don't know, I just see people as being able to do that. And so whether it's a painter or, or a director or a writer or et cetera, it's like, yeah, this person may be, be you know, pretty terrible, but they can also go and hug their kids and really love them sincerely. That, that definitely happens. And kind of what you're saying, that's not going to contaminate me, right? And I also don't want to sanitize my life where I'm just not seeing anything potentially at all objectionable that's unrealistic and not really living life. And so um, that's usually the answer. Some variant of that is the answer I, I usually give to people when they- But I'm, I'm really curious about your friend's argument and what the end point of it is. You know, mm-hmm. if he's saying, no, you can't divorce the good idea from whatever badness exists in the mind and heart and life of the person who had it how i mean well i suppose what what does he what conclusion does he draw then about how we're supposed to engage with art so he doesn't have an answer he just questions it right and he he has this really lovely way of trying to figure it out of saying does it does it not? I don't know. So as an example, in, in, in that world, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, Martin Heidegger, who was obviously a part of the a member of the Nazi party. And he didn't, you know, uh, uh, um, say anything negative about it. He didn't leave the Nazi party, uh, even after the war. Um, and it's like, should we be reading his philosophy? It's like, yeah, of course we should. It's a great philosophy. It's, it's a great philosophy ontology. It's great. Um, you don't have to agree with it, but it's great. And there are some people that will say, well, the person that believes all these horrible things, ostensibly, is writing this philosophy. So somehow, somewhere, if I'm reading his philosophy, I'm somehow maybe, even though he writes nothing about um, uh, social implications of people. And then you can also look at his personal life and see that he had a very interesting, complicated relationship with uh, Hannah Arndt, who's a Jewish German philosopher who also was you know, people don't like her too much, but you know, how could that make sense? And so it's just complicated. And so my friend and I, when we talk about this, we'll just say, he's like, I don't know. I don't know how much his personal life was influencing his philosophy. I, he's like, I would, he, his, I think claim is I would suspect something. It's not completely divorced. It's not like he turns himself off when he sits down to write, <laughs> you know, anything. No one does that. But in my kind of contribution here is I think there's just, there's just different, there's so many different compartments and so many different layers to what it means to be human, that we can have all of these things, like something's kind of humming in the background, uh, things that we don't potentially know, but then we can do some really awesome things where we can, you know, where I'm in this mode and I'm thinking about this way of doing this. And so I think that you can, I think, I'll say it this way, I think terrible people, quote unquote, can do some really awesome things, some really good things. 
And that makes us uncomfortable and vice versa. I think really good people can do some really terrible things. I, I'm using those terms generally. I don't really believe in good. Right. Or no, but I think that this, I mean, maybe when it comes to, we talked about decoupling, but mm -hmm. I think that maybe another issue here is how comfortable any individual person might be with the idea that every human being contains right. the capacity to do evil. That's right. Um, you know, given the type of work that I do and the types of stories that I write and, you know, just in general, I don't know, for whatever, whatever reasons, you know, whatever the, the stew is that makes me the person I am, I'm perfectly comfortable with that. Yes. Yes. Um, and I can think of a lot of writers um, who I think also have a comfort with that that is reflected in their writing in and, you know, in the fact that their writing is sophisticated when it comes to engaging with issues like this, you know, mm -hmm. that there's a certain, uh, you know, ability to delve deeply into it without getting squirrely. Yeah. Um, but that's a challenge for some people. Yeah. And I, I, you and I are very much the same on this point. Um, partly it's just my personality and partly it's my, my own clinical work. I mean, I worked in inpatient hospitals for six, seven years. <laughs> Human depravity is not uh, foreign to me and seeing it and hearing about mm -hmm. it and things like that. And still a person, right? And we're still products of evolution and we still have uh, many things we don't know and understand. And, you know, it, I, I think it's, it doesn't make them certain people uh, not worthy of basic human rights, even if they do the most horrible things. It's, there's, humans are really complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and so... I guess the follow-up to this uh, is when people get, you know, when some of these terrible figures, um, you know, they do time or they go away or we don't hear from them, how do we as a society punish negative behaviors, but then also how do we have a redemptive or rehabilitative component to that? How do we let people back into society? How do we let Kevin Spacey do movies again, right? How do we... How do we, you know, how are we okay with, with certain directors filming again? You know, how do we, how do we say, okay, you, you fucked up. You made a, some a very egregious mistakes. You did your time, maybe legally, you got rehabilitation. You did lots of therapy, you did lots of your own, like whatever. And you went away for a while, you know, maybe four or five years. And then, okay, you know, slowly you come back and do something you're good at. Uh, how, it, do we, I mean, I think I know what your personal answer would be. It would probably be similar to my personal answer. But how do we as a society kind of foster that kind of redemptive, you know, rehabilitative uh, spirit? Well, as a society, we're goddamn terrible at it. <laughs> yes, um... <laughs> yes. Somebody did one bad thing and we're going to condemn them forever. It's like, yeah, have, you, have you met a human before? I mean, people like everyone makes mistakes. I mean, the irony is that, you know, we have at least in our criminal justice system, as long as you didn't commit a sexually based offense, in which case you're basically given a life sentence of parietum. Right. Um, you know, we do actually have a process in place for punishing people and then hopefully rehabilita rehabilitating them and releasing them back into society where they can become, once again, productive members of society. Um, we don't do that very well. We could really do it a lot better. And I think that one of the things that stands in the way of our becoming, you know, less of a carceral state is this resistance to forgiving people who do evil things. This resistance to understanding that all people contain the capacity to do evil. Um, and I mean, one of the, so criminal justice reform is an issue really, really near and dear to my heart. And mm -hmm. um, something that I find very frustrating in trying to have conversations about it, you know, within like the discourse is discovering how many people who claim to be advocates for criminal justice reform imagine that what this really means in practice is just letting a bunch of wrongfully convicted people out of prison who didn't actually do any crimes. Mm -hmm. um, people have a very, very hard time coming to terms with the fact that if you genuinely want to reform the criminal justice system, you are going to be a trying to rehabilitate and then release people who have done heinous things, things that will curl your goddamn hair. Yeah. Um, 
most of the people who are in prisons right now are there because they did something really bad. You know, they weren't wrongfully convicted. They weren't convicted for like a, you know, a nonviolent drug offense. That's like this unicorn that everyone talks about. Mm -hmm. Some are sure, but you know, the majority are people who did harm, you know, who, who hurt somebody really terribly. And, you know, we have such a hard time even discussing that reality, you know, let alone moving past it to discuss, you know, what would it look like to start rehabilitating people who did heinous, heinous things. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but that's, and that's just in our official system. And then in our social justice system, we got nothing. Like, mm -hmm. we just want you to go away and die, basically. Right. Right. Um, and I think the thing is that, I mean, the, the social desire for revenge just doesn't lend itself to any kind of, you know, more cool headed template for bringing people back in. You know, there's always going to be one person loudly banging a drum and saying, no, you can never come back. You should go to a cave and die. And that person ends up setting the tone for the conversation. And so people have no choice but to just kind of like make their way forward as best they can. Um, I think that it would be good for us as a society to you know, invest more in the idea of redemption, to allow people the grace to return, and to allow for the fact that somebody who's accused of having done something wrong in cases where it's not necessarily clear cut, um, you know, may go away for a moment, you know, they may weather their ostracization. But when they come back, they may not fully agree with you that they actually are the monster you say they are. And we need right. to also be okay with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, <sighs> right. I think certain individuals are probably, you know, fine with some version of that. I just think as society as a whole, <sighs> it just feels like, you know, we're on another planet, uh, which is really frustrating um, because at the end of the day, these are still humans. And um, we need to try our best with some of the, you know, tough, tough cases, which uh, kind of leads me to some of my last few points here for you is uh, it's a big one. You and I see this all the time. We get on Twitter and we see this um, is cancel culture, um, as it's so called. Um, and I, I don't know, I have a lot of thoughts and opinions about this. Uh, so I'm just curious about what you think about it. Uh, in general, I mean, what do you make of it? Um, I think one argument that people make is that this is the issue. Like, forget anything economic, forget anything foreign affairs. Like, cancel culture is the issue. That's the, that's the hill we're going to die on. And other, you know, it's, it's everything, right? Every, they see that, they put that lens on, they see the whole world through that. Um, other people totally act like it doesn't exist. And then you have some people like me who think, that it's a problem, but it's not something that is uh, as pervasive as uh, maybe other people make it out to be. So is this just kind of like a, a very online thing? Um, or is this, you know, something that really is a really big problem and continuously, you know, kind of metastasizing to other parts of our society? Um, I don't know. What do, you, what, do you, what do you just generally think about it in that sense? Um, I think that people get too focused, and I, I'm borrowing this point from Camille Foster, who, mm -hmm. who's made it before. Um, people focus too much on individual cancellations and the merits thereof, and they don't focus on the culture, and the culture is the problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I and I do think that culturally there are few things that are a bigger problem than this. I mean, what it's doing. And I've written about this in in a couple mm -hmm. of different um, in a couple of different ways. What this does is it establishes a set of new norms whereby we are surveilling and snitching on each other. Um, we're afraid of each other. We don't trust each other. Right. Living in a high trust society is something that I think is very important. Um, mm -hmm. I you know I want to live in a high trust society. You know where people take care of each other because they trust each other um cancel culture you know if you want to call it that i don't i don't think that there's a better term so we might as well use it right, yeah. um works actively against that it mm -hmm. makes us afraid and it you know 
I don't think that it's unique to either the left or the right. I think because the left has such a cultural hegemony at this point, you see it more widespread on the left. You know, the the more sort of like high profile cancellations mm -hmm. tend to be happening coming from the left. Um, but what it's really a function of is is the fact that we've become very tribalized um, at a moment when we also have suddenly the technological capability to be filming each other and punishing each other you know mm -hmm. all the time by by posting each other's worst moments mm -hmm. online um that is a huge shift in how in what it means to be a person like living in a society, you know, to know that anytime you leave the house, you might, you know, if something bad happens to you, if you have a bad moment, you might be filmed, you might be exposed, you might be made famous for this one like 30 second bad moment. Um, I can't overstate enough, like, what that does to people psychologically yeah, 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 um, and and what that does to a society. So do I think it's a problem? Yeah, I think it's a huge problem um, and not, you know, not for political reasons, but because mm -hmm. it's making it difficult for us to live together. Yeah, I'd agree. I think it's I'm, I'm very tired of uh, things to be so reactionary, uh, which is really just kind of what uh, social media kind of kind of fosters. Um, my friend, uh, Angel Eduardo, he has this nice saying where he'll say, um, you know, I, I'm all about the cold take, you know, I don't like the hot take. I just want to put it in the freezer for a couple hours and come back to it and see if I still am outraged about it. And I, I, I firmly agree with that. I think it's, mm -hmm. people have a very hard time exercising self-control and, you know, there's, you know, as an example, just cause it's popping in my head is, you know. AOC wears a dress that says tax the rich and like, you know, just for three days, that's all I saw on both sides of the, of, of the spectrum. And I'm just like, why are we giving this so much oxygen? Why are we giving this so much attention? Why do we care so much if it's hypocritical, if it's a great advocacy statement, if it's, I, I, why do we care? I just don't know why. <laughs> like, I don't really care. I, I didn't make a post about it. I didn't really care. I saw it. I rolled my eyes and I kept moving with my life. I just, I don't know. I, I just feel more and more and more that people are too plugged in and they have, I don't want to say have less of a life, but it's just, there are more important things in life in some ways. And I don't think everything needs to be, you know, spotlighted and everyone needs to have a, a take on it. That being said, there are some instances where, you know, people have been like literally you know, fired from their job because they made a stupid joke in an elevator, which is absurd, mm -hmm. which is absolutely absurd. You know, so I don't know. Again, there's there's no nuance here, right? It's just you're at the chopping block. You're putting the leper colony or, you know, yeah. So, yeah. I don't know if you have a response on that. but I mean, I think that, you know, for you to bring up uh, AOC is an interesting thing, because unlike so many of the people who are suffering immense harms, you know, within this culture, she's actually a public figure. You know, she's mm -hmm. actually somebody who's statements and whose behavior um has some bearing on how the rest of us live our lives she's literally helping to make policy so i mean the the people who actually merit the kind of scrutiny that thrives under cancel culture are public figures politicians you know the problem with it is that it's seeped out so that everybody gets the same mm -hmm. treatment yeah. and ordinary people are being treated like political targets on whom you need to keep an oppo file so that you can get them before they get you. Right. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, kind of connected with that is this idea of uh, free speech. Again, uh, this is something that I think everything becomes super watered down and like really just kind of decimate it in some ways. And so one of the things that I see now is that you know, classical liberals from the 60s were really big advocates of this. And now it's pretty much center right or conservative uh, thinkers that are advocates for free speech. Not not entirely, but, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, hi. No. Right. Right. I'm not, not, give, I'm not letting them have it. <laughs> right. 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 But I was just saying that that is something in that circle that you hear a lot more than you would have 40, 50 years ago. So I don't think it's definitely a right or left issue, but um, there are definitely people on the left that are very much against 
free speech in some ways. They might not say it that way, but they definitely will want to censor people or how they want to say things. And I guess my question about that is, um, you know, are there limits to free speech? You know, is there, you know, some, uh, you know, or do you believe in some kind of absolutism? I guess one example is when people are being censored from very large private companies platforms such as YouTube because they don't like what they're saying and they have rules and regulations. People will use that as, oh, I'm being censored. I can't speak freely. Um, and I don't know if that's completely true. Um, it's unfortunate, but I don't know if it's completely a free speech issue. So I don't know. How do you see the kind of limits and boundaries of free speech? And are we talking about it in kind of, you know, educated or appropriate ways? So our constitution includes some carve outs for, you know, when free speech isn't so free. Um, I think that those are probably good and that we should not be attempting to improve upon them. You know, not that they're perfect, but, you know, I, I do kind of think having examined the way that these issues play out in other countries that have less robust speech protections. Um, yeah, I think that, that what we've got is is the best that it gets. Um, I also think that inevitably when people try to chip away at speech protections, all they end up doing is empowering the state to quash dissenting speech, critical speech of you know, the people in power. So this is, I think, you know, the best argument for being as close to an absolutist on free speech as possible, mm -hmm. that historically you see this over and over maintaining robust speech protections is a way of protecting marginalized people, minorities, unpopular opinions. Um, and, you know, nobody thinks that that's important until they suddenly have an opinion that's been deemed unpopular until someone's mm -hmm. trying to suddenly silence them from saying something they feel is completely reasonable. Um, so that's where I stand on the idea of, of curtailing speech. I think that we should be trying to do it as little as humanly possible because the alternatives are just terrible. Mm -hmm. um, so then, oh, sorry. No, no, go question? Ahead. no go ahead. Okay. Um, and then what was the other question? It was, um, oh, tech platforms. That's an issue that I am still trying to think my way through. Um, mm -hmm. What strikes me is that when we live in a society as we do where the government is severely restricted in terms of its ability to curtail speech that it actually becomes that much more important to make sure that we also have strong social and private protections for speech mm -hmm. because the government doesn't have that much power in the first place instead it rests either with people but increasingly with corporations that run the platforms on that have become our public square and I do think it's worrisome that, you know, for instance, what happened with what happened with Parler, right? You know, you had people who were who were kicked off Twitter and it was like, your speech, your free speech isn't being curtailed. Go make your own platform. OK, so they did. And then that platform was dismantled by powerful corporations who you know refused to host it on their servers who wouldn't like you know who wouldn't allow them to to use whatever system for payment you have put this enormous power to quash speech in the hands of a few enormous tech companies who might as well be a government that's how powerful they are um and to be clear, I don't really know what the solution is here. I just think it's something worth taking seriously. And people who try to, to write it off with a kind of a facile, well, private corporations can do what they want. I don't think that they're really grappling in the way that we need to with what it means in 2021 to have your voice basically removed from every major platform in right. which you know people i mean it's like it's you know it's sort of like saying oh you can still speak like we're just gonna put you in a box in the middle of the woods and you can right. yell in there to your heart's content <laughs> um where nobody can hear you right. like you know there there's something happening there that's worth exploring and exploring in depth and keeping an open mind about yeah no i agree i don't have an answer on it either i just my my idea is that you probably you, you probably need to treat some of those private companies like uh, you know like you would the federal government i'm not saying the same but that there needs to be some regulations and basically my fresh thoughts on that is that you you should just create you basically have a new category right it's not a government entity 
And it's, it's a private company that is past a very certain limit, right? And that, that's a special category. I mean, obviously, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple. I mean, there's just, I mean, the amount of influence, the amount of money, the amount of, they're just in their own category than, you know, many, most of, uh, uh, of the businesses that, that exist. And so, you know, there probably has to be a, a ceiling or floor of, you know, where that kind of space is, that category. And then with that, there's new regulations. I don't know. I mean, I think any solution anybody offers, one side's going to be furious. One side's going to love it. I don't think there's a perfect solution. So, but obviously it is, it's still an issue. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I've often wondered if, you know, since we do already have like constitutional protections in place where you can't, you can't suffer consequences for, you know, on the basis of your religion or your sex. So, I mean, there, there are, there are ideologies that we already protect. Um, and I sort of wonder if maybe that's where regulations could, you know, be, determined you know that that would that would offer more protection for people but i don't know i'm just kind of spitballing here yeah yeah i have two final quick questions uh the first one is kind of connected to that which is i don't know if you see it this way but i feel like many people now are kind of finding uh a kind of way to make money off of outrage i think you see this with big corporations you call it you know woke capitalism if you will right so you know there's a a movement Big companies now have learned, oh, this makes money. And so then it becomes very much uh, a factor of making money off of it and kind of watering it down and cheapening it, I guess. And, and then also people that end up do getting canceled, they need a place to go somewhere. And so they will, get, you know, whether it's Patreon or they'll get, you know, uh, payments from, from, from uh, people that there's kind of knowing that. And so they will kind of focus on whatever the one or two big issues are of the day and just, you know, spread that to their fans over and over and over and over and over because they're getting money off of it. And do you think that that's, um, am, am I too cynical on this? Right. Do, are you, do you think, you know, people are making money off of this and that they were kind of sort of bad faith actors now they're like, well, I can, I can just make money off of talking about, you know, race or anti-vaccine or whatever. And I know that people are going to just, you know, listen and read it all the time and, give me money for that? Or am I being too cynical on this? I don't know. I mean, isn't this the beauty of capitalism? Like if there's an audience <laughs> for it, you can sell it. Nobody is stopping you. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, maybe, maybe that's also a cynical take. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I don't know that necessarily, you know, making money off of something, means that you can connect that to bad faith that you can say, well, you're just making money off of this. So you don't really believe it. I mean, I'm thinking about like all of these Christian mega churches that, you know, do enormous amounts of fundraising. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. are they, you know, does that mean that their faith is not real? Um, I'm sure that they would be appalled, you know, by that idea. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I do think that there's this tendency to, just kind of point at anybody who's making a living um, or who's benefiting in any way from discussing ideas that you don't like. And this is not you personally, this is like the hypothetical you, yeah, yeah. but to point at that person and say, they're a grifter. And grifter just means a person who is making money discussing ideas that I don't like, you know, whereas a person making money discussing ideas I do like is, um, you know, a valuable public intellectual who deserves to be re rewarded monetarily for mm -hmm. their important mm -hmm. contributions. So, yeah, I mean, until until that stops happening, I think, you know, it's it's very hard to have an honest conversation about this stuff. Yeah. Uh, the final question I have is uh, kind of going back to your your book, your novel, um, which is, you know, do you think that um, women, uh, like a, a female audience, are drawn to crime? I mean, this is a very popular uh, category of novels uh, for, you know, romance novels have some, you know, crime of passion or things like that. There's, there's many uh, novels that are written about this. Um, do you think that, you know, women are drawn to, to stories about crime, both as... Uh, uh, readers and or writers or or you know is that just an oversimplification um do, do you think what do you think about that i think historically women have always been the bigger audience for novels um and 
Yeah, I, you know, I'm not sure that it's much more complicated than that. I mean, this may just have more to do with what interests women versus what interests men, although men also do like to read literature. Um, do they, are they more interested in crime? You know, there is there is this line of thought that says, oh, well, women, you know, are are in such constant danger under patriarchy that they're drawn to these stories in which like the evil is controllable, it's on the page, you know, it's a safe way to kind of engage with the darkness that otherwise permeates our lives in uncontrollable ways. I don't really think that's true. Um, mm -hmm. I think people just, you know, I mean, people love stories, we always have. And I think, you know, murder has always been fascinating to us. Um, the less common it becomes, and it has become much less common over the course of the past, you know, couple thousand years of history, mm -hmm. the less common it becomes, the more we love to read about it. Mm -hmm. um, and th that may not have really anything to do with women so much as it has to do with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, will you write a sequel? To this? Mm -hmm. No, I think no? I I think not. Um, maybe way down the line. You know, what okay. I love the idea of is to is to write, um, I'm working on my next book now. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea of creating this kind of like Stephen King-esque sprawling universe in which, you know, mm -hmm. like all of the stories maybe have little tiny bits of connection. So that maybe someday down the road, mm -hmm. if I wanted to revisit one of these characters, yeah. maybe that person would pop up in a different novel unexpectedly mm -hmm. um but yeah. you know but now i'm getting ahead of myself short <laughs> answer uh right no. now no sequel okay okay well the the book is called uh no one will will miss her excuse me no one will miss her it's uh it is out uh next week and um, october 12th october you 12th can... and where can you find it uh, you can pre-order at any place that you pre-order books. There is also an audio version, um, which I have not heard, but I've heard from many people that it's excellent. And when I say excellent, I mean that it was excellently produced, not that like the writing is really good, even though it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And everyone should go and buy it. It's a, it's a fabulous uh, uh, story. Uh, Kat, you were, you were absolutely lovely. Uh, you're, you're very brilliant. Uh, it was so much fun talking with you about all this stuff. I, I really wanted to get your perspective and your voice here, and I was not disappointed uh, in the least. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. Thank you for inviting me on. Of course. Thank you for, for coming on. <laughs>